Please be seated. The court is now back in session. We would like to hand the floor to the lead co-lawyers for civil parties to put questions to the witness, Mr. Steve Heather. You may proceed. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Your Honours. Good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon to my colleagues, and good afternoon to you, Mr. Heder. My name is Elisabeth Simonofor. I am a civil party lawyer. I represent the civil parties, and I'm going to put to you a few questions. It will be, of course, much less lengthy uh, than uh, the prosecution. And uh, you said on 10 July to the prosecutor that beyond the documents uh, placed on the case file, beyond uh, the numerous uh, binders you have in front of you, you also wrote, drafted many other documents, and uh, interviewed many, more, uh, many other people. So I'm going to therefore base my questions on documents that are in the case file and also on the other documents, of course, because you are a witness, and therefore you can uh, tell us about what you have seen and heard, generally speaking. And my questions uh, will be, of course, uh, essentially focused on the civil parties and on the victims. So I'm going to start um, by the first topic I am interested in. And this is a period running from May 73 until 11 April 1975 during which you said that you were in Cambodia and in Phnom Penh. And I would like essentially, well, you told us that you had heard or met refugees, but not too many, and at least that, that's what I heard in the French translation. And even if there are not too many of these refugees, but I'm going to still ask you about what these refugees told you back then, between 73 and 75. So you said that these were refugees coming from the liberated zones. So my first question is, did these refugees speak to you about the living conditions in the liberated zones by the Khmer Rouge? And if yes, can you tell us what they told you? I think from that period, the 73 to 75 period, I, I don't really have a lot to relate about conditions in the so-called liberated zones um, because I, I, I had some general just accounts of the way things were organized uh, in broad terms. Um, and there was certainly some talk of um, difficulties with rice production following the beginnings, or more than the beginnings, of cooperativization. Some talk of um, executions and the like. Um, but for, for better or for, for worse, um, in that period, I was more focused on trying to do what I could. And again, it wasn't very much uh, with regard to Khmer Rouge structure and organization, uh, policy, leadership, and, and the like. I probably should have done a lot more on conditions, um, but at this stage, certainly, um, really quite little. So I'm not sure I have much to offer you in that regard for, for that period. No, and certainly nothing more than I've already stated. 
actually won an order of battle for the Khmer Rouge is related to me by the Japanese military, that I have somewhere. Um, but as for a, a detailed or even vague description of the situation in the liberated zones beyond structure and organization, as I said, some talk of agricultural difficulties following the attempts at cooperativization, some talk of executions, but not a lot. I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Well, in any case, I will not, of course, criticize you for the way you conducted your research. Now, beyond Ubong, Udong and Kompong Cham, which you spoke about, did you come close to any other liberated zones during that period? Um, I spent some time also in Batambong. Um, but Batambong was an area in which the liberated zones were in fact relative to the situation around Phnom Penh and around other provincial towns rather far away. Um, so again, my contact when I was in Batambong with the situation in the liberated zones was, was fairly minimal. And I'll say that my, I didn't go to Kampong Cham until sometime after the city was partially and briefly taken by the Khmer Rouge. Um, and to the extent that I talked to people about what had happened, it was mostly people who had been in the town and either escaped, evaded evacuation, or had been evacuated and then somehow managed to return. Udon, even fewer in that regard. Thank you. So now we're going to speak about another period, and maybe we will turn to the forced evacuation of Phnom Penh, which you spoke about a bit with the prosecutor during these three past days. And in particular, the prosecutor read to you an excerpt of document E3 slash 1740, which is the document that you drafted based on uh, several interviews with refugees at the Thai border in 1980. And now, regarding the evacuation plan of Phnom Penh, he read to you uh, account number 29. And I would like to read to you, therefore, uh, an excerpt from account number 18, which, according to your notes, is, a, is from a man from Takeo, maybe a member of the party. And I'm going to read to you uh, the following ERNs, French, uh, 00648992. English zero zero seventeen zero seven twenty seven Khmer zero zero thirty two forty seven thirty one and what I'm going to read to you is rather short. I don't think that you necessarily need to read it uh, in your hard copy. And this is what this person says, free translation I quote. Uh, I have the impression that the evacuation plan a uh, plan of Plum Pen, correct interpreter, was part of a general uh, policy that had been around for a while because this is what we had always done when we would liberate an enemy zone. And in the past, we had evacuated people from the zones that we had liberated <clears throat> because we were afraid that we wouldn't be able to occupy these zones uh, if we would be attacked. And therefore, to be unable to guarantee the security of the population in those areas, and also because the population was a source of, was a workforce for us. And if we were able to gather the people, we would have uh, uh, sufficient forces to beat the enemy. Based on what I understood, the evacuation plan to evacuate Phnom Penh had two objectives. First, to maintain the security of our new, of our new regime, and also to to solve 
the uh, problems of the livelihood of uh, this population. Because in the countryside, there was rice and there were fields, and these people could produce and eat. And, and the main point here was that we could not know for sure who were the people from Tompen. We did not know who had been a London officer or a CIA agent. Therefore, we were afraid that our enemy uh, could uh, pop up, end of quote. So do you confirm also uh, this uh, account? Uh, yes, and it's generally consistent with what I've seen in some, at least some other documents and heard from other interviewees. Thank you. And you also said on 11 July to the prosecutor that and you said it again this morning, by the way, that as of the end of April 1975 and during the following weeks, you had gone to the Thai border and that you spoke then to evacuees. Can you tell me, can you tell us rather, what these evacuees told you? And we're going to start by the reasons that were given to them for this evacuation. What did they tell you about why they had been evacuated? Um, many of them came from Batambong or Posat or Siem Reap, places relatively close to the Thai border. Um, some of them described executions, um, particularly of uh, relatively high-ranking um, military and administrative personnel. Um, in though I don't, hmm. there was, as, if I recall, in, in those locations there was some talk of the threat of bombing, not necessarily of American bombing, but there was, the situation was still such that it was possible there might be bombing by remnants of the Khmer Republic Air Force, T-28s and other bombing capable fixed wing aircraft. Um, but in general, they were also told um, given this explanation that it was necessary for them to at least temporarily leave the towns in order that the Khmer Rouge troops could clear or sweep out uh, the FANC, that is to say Khmer Republic military remnants or diehards um, that might attempt to continue to, to fight them. And this was, a, this was an issue in, in Batambong, um, not only in Batambong town, but in other parts of the province, because even as late as 17 April 1975, um, large parts of the province were still in Khmer Republic hands. Thank you. Did they also describe to you the conditions in which this evacuation was carried out, the way that people had to leave, the support that they might have received from the Khmer Rouge in terms of food, in terms of care? Um, it was clear that this was a strict order, that everybody had to relocate. Um, and were there instances in which, was I told of instances in which people had been killed for not going? Um, not that I specifically recall, but certainly there were descriptions given of um, 
armed forces coming in, people with guns, making it clear that that if people didn't leave, there was at least a potential threat to their lives. Again, as in Phnom Penh, in some of these places, people were prepared to go uh, at least somewhat voluntarily. Many of them had come from the countryside. Um, the distinction between rural and urban in western Cambodia and in these provincial towns was even less than was the case with Phnom Penh. Um, so it wasn't entirely forced. Um, and again, as I described in one of my answers to the prosecution about the unpublished story about what people thought was going to happen, at the very beginning at least, um, many didn't foresee that the situation, once they got into the countryside or back to the countryside, was going to be as dire as it very quickly or in some cases immediately turned out to be. So maybe you have answered my following question partially. So my question, therefore, is why do these people seek refuge abroad? Did they tell you why they, aside from describing the disastrous conditions in the countryside, which you might be able to expand upon, but can you tell us why they sought refuge outside of Cambodia? Uh, well, many of them were from among this upper strata these upper strata of the military and civil administration of the Khmer Republic uh, regime, and in many cases also the predecessor Songkhom regime, um, and word very quickly spread, or rumors and reports very quickly spread about the fate of at least some of those senior or relatively senior upper strata military and civil administration personnel who had been gathered up and told um, something or another about getting their old jobs back or meeting Sihanouk um, and then were known to or believed to have been or feared to have been killed. Um, this included a, a stories about a, a a massacre that occurred, if I recall correctly, in the Phnom Tipide area of Batambong. And that was one of these instances in which um, the story that was told to those who were gathered up was that they were going to meet, uh, greet a returning Prince Sihanouk. Uh, it has to be said also that there were some instances in which former Khmer Republic senior military and senior administrative personnel were killed not by the Khmer Rouge but their own troops um, who blamed them for all kinds of things that had happened under the Khmer Republic. But that was sort of a, a, a fringe phenomena. That happened I think particularly in, in Siem Reap. Um, so not all the killing was done by the Khmer Rouge that were killing by lower level Khmer Republic or ordinary people. As I described the situation in Phnom Penh, there was a lot of hatred, I think it would be fair to say, certainly dislike, dissatisfaction with the Khmer Republic regime. Um, so there was a bit of that kind of killing as well. So if you were a, a, a relatively high-ranking Khmer Republic military officer or civilian administrator, it seemed to make very good sense to to Thailand and as far away from Cambodia as possible, as quickly as possible. Thank you for this clarification. I'm now going to read to you an excerpt of a civil party statement, and then I will ask you a question. So I would like to read now to you an excerpt of Civil Party's T D twenty two slash three hundred six statement, and this is a civil party who was eighteen years of age in nineteen seventy five, and the era ends are the following: French zero zero, eighty nine, eighty, eighty three, English zero zero, eighty six, forty, fifty eight, 
and Khmer 00 48 43 85 to 86. And this civil party says the following. And this is a, a civil party who was evacuated from Phnom Penh. And free translation, when Ankar asked us to prepare our, pos our, our possessions, our family started doing so and we left immediately. We were ready to leave our house just with a few personal belongings, such as clothes, rice, and salt. And we started walking towards Kbaltnal on the road to Takmau, Kandal province. And on that day, the roads were filled with people who were leaving their homes and leaving in all different directions. The roads were packed with people, whether old or young, women and men, loaded with their personal belongings. Some of them were carrying their belongings on carts. Cars and motorcycles could not proceed. Young children were crying because they had lost their parents and uh, they were a sad sight to see. Old, senior pe old people could not walk and they would sleep along the road. My family members walked for seven days to arrive at Kabaltnal Roundabout. When we arrived at the Kabaltnal Roundabout, I saw dead swollen bodies of soldiers and I was really scared. There was strict guarding along the way by Ankar cliques wearing black shirts. They were guarding in order to prevent people from fleeing back into the city. My family members were walking separately. So, does this excerpt resemble through one or several details things that you had heard yourself from evacuees? Um, if we talk in terms of not only things that I was told in April of 75, latter part of April, beginning of May 75, on the Thai-Cambodian border, but over subsequent years, certainly yes. Thank you. Now I'm going to read to you another excerpt, which is taken from the transcript of 5 December 2012. The index is E1 slash 148.1. And this is another civil party stating the following, and I quote, free translation, I saw a lot of people on the road. People were walking from the Russian hospital, and I saw that there were patients who are on hospital, bed, uh, hospital beds being pushed with a drip. Some of them, therefore, were still, under a, still with a drip, and we had to all leave in one single direction, we weren't moving ahead very quickly, and we saw some of them who were riding bicycles or who had rickshaws. Others were transporting their personal belongings. Others were walking, and some were ill, and everyone was walking in the same direction. There was a very tense atmosphere, and the Khmer Rouge, the Khmer Rouge soldiers, did not allow us to travel freely. And a bit further, the civil party says the following, at French ERN, 008695. English, 008681140. Khmer, 008669, to 42 and the civil party is asked if the Khmer Rouge would give them food or medicine, and the civil party answered, during our evacuation, the Khmer Rouge soldiers gave us neither food, nor water, nor shelter. So we left without having brought with us enough food or personal belongings, and therefore, in the evening, 
when we arrived, we at, at a place where we rested, we had to uh, lay out fabric to uh, to rest, and the f food that we had that we had brought along with us for three days had practically disappeared. So here, once again, can you tell us if among the people you spoke to, and here I'm not only referring to the people from 1975, but from, I'm referring to all of the people you heard, does this resemble what you yourself heard? Um, it certainly resembles um, many of the accounts that I recall having heard. Um, there are other accounts according to which there was better provision of transport, food, water. Medication, I think, is, a, is, is, a, is an, virtually a non-issue. Um, and better reception once they got to wherever it was they were first deposited to use the, uh, the in fact, the, the official term. Um, so I wouldn't say that the account that you just gave is uh, universally, d describes the, the universal situation. It certainly describes a significant uh, proportion of it may be uh, a, a kind of average um, account, but it, you know, it, it, again, in the situation in the West was was rather different. There was much more food available in the countryside. Um, the numbers of people coming down out of the towns, provincial towns, relative to the number of people in the countryside, was um, much smaller. So in the Northwest, um, the situation doesn't become so serious until the de facto failure of the first uh, paddy season crop. Remember that there are people are coming out in April um, 1975 there's still, at that time of year, a considerable amount of food left over from the previous year's harvest. And it's only when there's not enough food, generally not enough food produced to feed everyone, who's even, even those who are already there in the Northwest, that the situation begins seriously to deteriorate and then to deteriorate catastrophically when more and more people are brought in from the Southwest and the East creating a situation in which the, the, the foods, the ratio of people to food is, is, is very, very disfavorable to survival in many, in many places for many people. Thank you very much. Can we limit ourselves to forced transfer and perhaps not to the subsequent picture at the moment, we're just talking about the days of the forced transfer, and if you could answer me with relative brevity, that would be helpful because we don't have an awful lot of time. I'm going to read out another extract. It's the minutes of an interview with a civil party who was evacuated from Phnom Penh, and the question I'm asking is only connected with that forced transfer phase. The party says as follows, and it's D246 stroke 16, French ERN is 00434834. The English one is 00400463, and in Khmer it's 00390312. And this lady says, after the following question, what did you see on that day in Phnom Penh? Answer, when I got to the Dumko market, I saw two or three people who had been shot. Question, can you tell us 
more precisely about this. Who shot these people and who were the people who had been killed? Answer, when we got there, we were blocked off by the Khmer Rouge soldiers with their firearms and they stopped us from going any further. I saw these Khmer Rouge soldiers end the lives of two or three people by shooting them. Those people were doubtless people who owned houses, who refused to come out of them. I witnessed this with my own eyes. Question, what sort of um, clothing were they wearing? Answer, I saw that they were dressed in uh, black clothing and caps. Question, did you see many people along the streets in Phnom Penh leaving the city? Answer, everybody had to leave the city after an announcement by the Khmer Rouge who announced that people had to leave the city for three days because they were afraid that the Americans would bombard. They would clean the city first. And three days later, people would be allowed to return. Mr. Witness, did you hear statements of this kind from individuals? I'm not really asking you to ask us what you have heard about uh, in the majority or the minority, so to speak, just if you heard these kinds of things at all from people who you spoke to. Thank you. I think there were some instances in, I believe it was Badambong, of people being shot or threatened with being shot if they didn't leave their homes. Um, on the other specific points, this famous specification of three days, my recollection is that wasn't commonly said with regard to these places in Western Cambodia. Temporary, yes. Temporary specifically for three days and then return, I don't recall that having been a theme. Thank you. On the subject of the first force transfer, I want to look at a couple of further extracts from a civil party at a hearing on the 30th of May 2013. It's E1 stroke 199.1. This is Mrs. Pau Dina, French ERN 9199. English 00 91 77 21 and in Khmer 00 91 79 84. And this person describes a rather particular event, and she said, Once we were there, we were told over the loudspeaker that people had to register. Some people went to register. My husband wanted to do so, but I told him that things weren't looking good, so we better not register our name. We just went on walking, so we kept walking. And in the following ERN in French, but on the same page in English and Khmer, she says that once we got there, they once again called us for family registration and we registered the members of our family and they categorized us as 17th of April people. That's what they called us, 17th of April people. They told us that we were 17th of April people so we couldn't stop there. We had to go on walking. And I begged them to let us stay there for some time because we had been tired. And they refused. They said that 
their village was in a state of shortage of food, so we had to go on. Now, that kind of registration and census among people who you talk to, not only in 75 and not only for the western part of the country, did you hear this kind of uh, circumstance or phenomenon being described? I, I think that one, I can say, was close to universal. Done somewhat less comprehensively in the West initially than places where the Khmer Rouge administration was more settled, but done everywhere. The President, uh, Council, please hold on. Mr. Victor Cope, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think it's about time I start objecting to the way these questions are being phrased. Um, let us remind ourselves that Mr. Heder here is a witness and that in general terms a witness should not be led into um, his answers. Up until now, when the prosecutor was asking questions, uh, it was always about uh, his own articles or his own interviews. Uh, and now we are confronting, or we, we're uh, seeing this witness being confronted with witness statements of testimony of other people. And then uh, Mr. Heather is invited to, to give a comment. Now, um, the whole issue of, of the evacuation is, is, is not a crucial of issue and the things that happened there to the new Chia defense team, but I still think that this is not a proper way of eliciting information. So uh, I, I think it is uh, important that the witness is being asked uh, open questions and not leading in the way that has been done so far. And in addition to this, and that's why I also raised, um, I hear the witness saying that this practice described by this particular witness was uh, a universal practice. Now, uh, it is interesting for a witness to be able to determine if something is universal practice, but it at least seems to be an opinion uh, on the things that happen uh, presumably in the whole of Democratic Kampuchea in 75 and afterwards. So I would also ask um, uh, you, Mr. President, in the chamber to remind the witness not to give general or universal statements as to things that happened in 75. So my objection is twofold. It's leading and it is inviting apparently the witness to give an expert opinion on what happened in um, DK in 75 uh, and, and afterwards. If I may, Mr. President, I will answer that. For more than 18 months, I have been questioning witnesses in this manner. The most recent, Mr. Ponchou, who is perhaps the most comparable to Mr. Heder as a witness, and I was using civil party statements. I was not asking for comments on the statements. I was asking if the witness himself had heard identical things or, where applicable, seen identical things. I was not asking for any kind of further comment. I was asking him about things he had heard or seen or not heard or seen. If I may, I will continue. So far, there haven't been any objections to this procedure, and I would like to be able to continue uh, employing it for the few weeks remaining to us. The President, uh, Council, please uh, move on. And the Chamber wishes to advise uh, the uh, witness uh, that uh, in response to the question put by parties, uh, please uh, in the, uh, try to be uh, brief uh, so that uh, we can move on to other question. And uh, it may be appropriate uh, for the time allocated to each party as well.
Merci, Monsieur le Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to come back now to the new people who you were discussing with the prosecutor in previous days on various occasions. And among the people you were able to speak to over the years, in fact, if I've counted correctly, more than 30 years, have these people given you specific descriptions of the treatment that was meted out to the new people or not? Um, I had a bit of a loss as to how to deal with the back and forth on what the scope of the answer should be. Um, certainly, I've spoken to many people who were categorized as new people. Um, and there's a one can conclude that overall um, there was a certain tendency of treatment in their regard, uh, but at the same time there was variation. Um, and I'm not sure if I'd have to be brief. I'm not sure how much more how much more specific I can be, and if so, how. Let's see if I can fit this into the time I have. I'll read out an extract from the 12th of December 2012, a civil party in a hearing E1 slash 152.1. The French ERN is 008713 in English. It's 00. 8712.53 and in Khmer it's 00 86.96.55. This civil party, Mrs. Afonso, said the following. Firstly, she was asked a question. You told us just now. Mrs. Afonso, that in your village the distinction between the new and old people that you referred to was very visible. Can you explain to us the consequences of that distinction? Her answer was, well, it was very obvious because, for example, with the distribution of rice, we had one portion of rice and they had two. Their women did not work they had enough to eat. Their women were also able to give birth. I saw two pregnant women like that. And they had enough to eat. We did not have enough to eat. They had meat and fish. We only had salt with our rice. And we only ate rice porridge. We were only entitled to two meals a day and each time it was just a ladle of that porridge. Otherwise what did we eat? Frogs, grasshoppers and scorpions. Anything I could pick up in the countryside I ate. We even ate cockroaches when we found some we were turned into animals. We fought over scraps of food with their dogs, and their dogs had more to eat than we did. Mr. Heder, I'm not going to ask you to say if this corresponds to the general picture. I'm going to ask you if you personally heard people describing things of that kind. I think the answer has to be some yes, or maybe many yes, somewhere between some and many yes. Thank you for that concision and precision. Staying on the question of new people and on the matter of propaganda, I'd like to quote again from 
transcript. It's an extract from an interview of, win, inter, of Witness 338 on the 22nd of August 2012. The transcript is E1 stroke 112.1. French ERN is 00841318. In English, it's 00841201 and 02. And in Khmer, it's 00839903. This person was responsible for drafting articles, some of which were broadcast over the radio, and what he says is the following. First he's asked a question. I am coming back to the term new people. Have you written about this term new people in your articles? Incidentally, let me add that this witness did not write for revolutionary youth, nor for revolutionary flag. The answer. As a matter of our publication policies, there was no distinction whatsoever between the old and new people. And in the article, we were restricted from making that distinction, and that was mentioned in the revolutionary flag. But in our ordinary publica publications, we were not allowed to make this distinction. Part of our journal was for radio broadcast. We would only extract a certain portion that did not concern the policies and party line. And we constantly received advice from our superiors that broadcasting was like carrying artillery. It had enormous impact. So before any article was broadcast, it had to be reviewed time and again. We couldn't decide to broadcast it at our own prerogative. It had to go through review. And the editor-in-chief had to revise the content in order to ensure that it had less impact. Question. You said that the revolutionary flag mentioned the term new people. Can you tell me what it said about new people? Answer. I don't recall this particular issue. I did not actually see it with my own eyes. But I only wanted to refer to the authorization. Our newspaper didn't have the authority to write about anything that was secret. But in revolutionary flag, they could write something that was secret for the party. My question is as follows. Among all of the people that you have had an opportunity to speak to, especially cadres and party members, did you ever hear that distinction being drawn between the kind of propaganda that was for party members and propaganda that was aimed at the population or for the wider world? Uh, yes, certainly there was a distinction to be made between propaganda and education, to use, I guess, the, the more exact term, within the party ranks and vis-a-vis what in the party language were known as the masses. On this particular point, I'm not sure I understood what your witness said, and I'm not sure that from what I was told, it was a matter of having a distinction between new people and what I translate as veteran people in party circles and not having that distinction outside of party circle. I'm not sure that is one of the things for which there was such a policy distinction. But yes, in general terms, some things were reserved for internal party consumption. Other things were disseminated for mass consumption. Merci. Thank you. I'd now like to have a quick look at the matter of enemies and traitors, which you also discussed with the prosecutors. And, in fact, when the prosecutor asked your question, quoting the case 
of uh, petty thieves who stole things like spades, the prosecutor asked you about people who could be executed for the mere theft of a spade, and you said, yes, that was on the 11th of July, 12 o'clock and eight minutes. I want to read you two small extracts from civil party witness testimony, and I'd like to ask you if you heard about anything similar. The first extract is drawn from D22 stroke 3765 French ERN 00 892711 English 00 892763 and Khmer 00875010 The civil party says the following As for the other Khmers I saw the Khmer Rouge taking them away for execution without any kind of mercy, although they had simply stolen a tube of bamboo full of palm juice or an egg from a chicken's nest or a cockerel. Some of them were accused of having discreetly taken away a few grains of rice to cook them and eat them. These people were all executed, tortured or beaten to death. I want to say here that two of my children were executed because they had stolen a little bit of food to appease their hunger. The second very short extract that I want to read on this topic is drawn from a transcript of the 12th of December 2012 E1 stroke 152.1 and this is Denise Afonso once again and she told us just before 1538 minutes and 40 seconds responding to a question about her son do you know why he was treated in this way and beaten in this way and she answers yes because like all children of his age one day he went to look for some kindling wood and instead of cutting the wood with his friends they took some wood that was already cut and they were caught by the schlop who told them you are are the children of corrupt people. You're continuing to steal and you will therefore be punished, duly punished. And that was the way it was, end of quote. Mr. Header, among the people you have talked to, did you hear similar stories? Yes, many. Thank you. Now I'm going to talk about uh, force, uh, about the second force transfer, which you spoke about a bit this morning uh, with uh, the prosecutor. Among the people you interviewed or you heard, did people describe to you the conditions? under which these forced transfers happened. You spoke this morning about the reasons, but what about the conditions in which these forced transfers took place? Do you mean conditions of transport? General conditions, transport, food, uh, care provided, uh, Um, well, by boat, truck, and train, often under quite crowded conditions, typically with little food, not a lot, um, in circumstances in a manner that left them, in many instances, not able to, to sleep or rest, um, and therefore in many instances arrived wherever it was they were going uh, weaker, sicker, and hungrier than they had started out, therefore in very poor, relatively very poor condition. Um, in what, uh, and a, a lot of this was uh, done under some form of military control and or guard. Um, 
with the, the people being trans transported, transferred from one military operation of the next when they crossed, for example, a zone border or a sector border or another CPK uh, administrative border. Thank you. Now I'm going to read to you a few other short excerpts of civil party statements uh, regarding the uh, second force transfer. And the first excerpt uh, comes from or oh, civil party D22-2068 and the French ERN is 00-92-34-28-29. English 0 0 89 33 84 and Khmer 0 0 54 45 11 uh, 41 and this civil party says the following in 1976 as most of the people living there I was deported by train to Porsats we were very many of us and my father Haikut my mother known as Yem, were deported from Saong district to Bati district uh, in Takeo province. I uh, had no news from them. My brothers and sisters, uh, my brother and sister known Ken as Yun and Rom were also with my parents in Takeo. And I traveled by train with my two children to Pursat. The train was packed. I don't know where the other people came from. Little children were looking for their parents and they were crying and the group leaders uh, threw them out the windows of the train. They were, and as I was terrified by the scene, I hugged my children. And when the night fell, the train stopped. We didn't have any mosquito nets. We had no blankets to protect ourselves uh, from the insects. And the next day, we had to continue w on foot led by two armed men who were following us and they scattered us into the different cooperatives and the second excerpt comes from a, a written record of interview D217-3 French ERN 0037-2053 English 0035-3702 Khmer 0, 0, 34, 94, 97 to 98. And the excerpt that I'm going to read to you is the following. About two weeks about after the meeting, the people started being evacuated. The people were uh, set to work by large canals with about 100 people by I saw many canals because this was a major evacuation taking place that took place in all villages in this Lovia M district. The canals stopped at Ponyalu district. And then we were transferred by truck that brought us to Danaksak station. And we stayed there for one week where the Khmer Rouge would give us uh, our uh, ration of rice. And a week later, the Khmer Rouge called out the people so that they board the trains to Bakong District, Pursat Province. So once again, and does, did you hear similar descriptions among the people you interviewed? Again, yes, many. Jean, merci. Now, I see that I don't have much time left, so I'm going to turn to another topic, which is uh, language. You said that you speak fluent Khmer, and you said to the prosecutor, or you shared several expressions with the prosecutor, such as draining the people or drying up the people from the enemy, and you also spoke about the new people, and you also spoke about capturing the people, seizing the people, removing the people. And my question is the following. Among 
all the interviews you conducted, did you note that the people interviewed would use a special kind of language corresponding to the period of democratic Kampuchea, for example, to qualify traitors, to characterize agricultural activity, to characterize the regime, the leaders, etc. Yes, there was a, a, a particular and easily recognizable, as it were, political dialect that was widely used by cadre and ordinary people alike um, under the, the CPK, under CPK administration, in the same way that there was a difference between the language that was political language that was spoken under Sihanouk and the political language that was spoken under Lon Nol, but more dramatically. Est-ce que vous pourriez could you give me an example? For example, to characterize agricultural activity, production, work in cooperatives, etc. Um, well, to start with the end, there was a particular party parlance word that was used to refer to production, Pakalpakan Paul. Um, as opposed to the simple colloquial Torsra. Um, famously, the word for to eat, of which there had previously been a, a fairly wide variety depending on social class, social status, social station. Everyone was expected to use a kind of peasantism hope for eat instead of in any of the other uh, possibilities. Um, so yes, I mean, for both for for, for common so, so, some words were made very. Were, were everybody was expected to speak a more common form of Khmer than had previously been spoken, at least by some people. Whereas conversely, there was a new a new set of vocabulary, mostly introduced via translation from Vietnamese. Um, where people had to speak at a, in a different register that was in some ways more formal, more official than had previously been the case. So it kind of moved in both directions at once. Thank you. And this sp specific parlance, is it only found in documents coming from the center, that is to say speeches, the official publications of the party, institutional documents, minutes of meetings, for example, or can we find, do we find this vocabulary only in these kinds of documents or can we also find it uh, in spoken language, such as in the spoken language of the cadres at different levels? President, witness, please wait. Council Vitor Coupe, you may proceed. I object, Mr. President. It's clearly an invitation uh, for an uh, expert opinion uh, and not a question to a witness. I don't believe that I'm asking Mr. Header to speak as an expert here. Of course, I'm sure he could do so. I am simply asking him to speak to me about what he heard and about what he saw and about what he read. And I know that he read a lot of documents, read a lot of documentary evidence. I know that he interviewed many people, in particular cadres. And I'd like to know if among what he heard and if he heard the same vocabulary among the cadres in their spoken language as in uh, the documents that he read. So I'm not asking him to provide his opinion. I'm simply asking him to share his observations.
President, the objection raised by the International Council for Nuanjia is appropriate. International lead co lawyer, please refresh your question. And we actually have reminded uh, all parties regarding the status of Mr. Steve Heather. Steve Heather is here as a witness, not as an expert. So please uh, prepare your questions accordingly. That is to direct your question to him as a witness. Anyhow, the time is appropriate for a short break. We will take a 20-minute break and uh, resume at 3 p.m. Court officer, please assist the witness during the break and have him return to the courtroom at 3 p.m.